We will sing, sing, sing And make music with the heavens We will sing, sing, sing Grateful that you hear us When we shout your praise The love about you, heaven and earth adore you. Kings and kingdoms bow down. Son of God, you are the one. You are the one. You are the one. You are the, you are the love that frees us. You are the light that frees us. Like a fire burning. Thanks for joining us this morning. It's great to have you here. It's uh, ah, we got a bigger crowd than we had this morning, and uh, thanks for joining us online. When if you're uh, joining us there, if you're not joining us there, then you don't have any idea I'm talking to you. So, so there. Not a lot. Not a lot of announcements this morning. Um, we still are under the COVID regulations that we've been under for a while. So uh, hopefully there'll be some change soon. Uh, it's been pretty uh, encouraging. I think people are optimistic. But we do have one announcement. We're going to have a uh, congregational meeting, a, a general meeting, in a couple of weeks uh, on uh, the 27th, on June 27th. And uh, we'd love to have all the members. We'd love to have everybody in the congregation here. But those that are members will be voting on a very important issue. We had uh, Paul and Juliana DeWeird here last week and uh, candidating as pastor of congregational care. And uh, the council met this past week and uh, decided to ask the congregation to extend a call to Pastor Paul and Juliana. So we need to get the congregation together to discuss that and make that decision as a church family. So uh, we will give you more details. I'm sure that we're going to have an in-person meeting for as many people as we can, but we'll also have it online so that uh, everybody can participate. 
and uh, yeah, we'll take it from there and make that decision. So mark that date. Uh, it'll be after the service on the 27th. All right? Okay. We want to celebrate the cross of Christ. And uh, Pastor Ted's going to be talking to us about the cross of Jesus and what does the cross do for us as, as uh, God's children. And, uh, but we want to celebrate that. It's, uh, the cross causes a lot of reaction among a lot of people. There's a scripture that says that it's a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. Uh, there's, uh, you know, passages that say that it's offensive, that it's, you know, it does all of these things. Uh, but also there's all the, the, the positive things, the root of our faith is in the cross of Jesus. The biggest, biggest exhibition of his love is in the cross. Amen. So we want to celebrate that today. We want to celebrate Jesus, and we want to celebrate his crucifixion and his resurrection. So. There is a truth, golden and ages. There is a promise of things yet to come. There is one born for our salvation, Jesus. There is a light that overwhelms the dark. There is a kingdom that forever reigns. There is freedom from the chains that bind us. Jesus, Jesus, who walks on the water, who speaks to the sea, who stands fire beside me. He roars like a lion. He bled as a man. He carries my healing in his hand. Jesus. There is a name I call in times of trouble. There is a song comforts in the night. There is a voice that calms the storm that rages. He is Jesus, Jesus, Messiah, my Savior. Wonderful 
now and give him your ears okay thank you worship team for another good job and as we reflect on uh, communion theme um, this uh, this Sunday uh, last Sunday of course we had uh, Pastor Paul and Juliana uh, the weird visiting us and and uh, it was a great a great time uh, but of course we put communion off from the first Sunday to, to the second Sunday so that's why we're doing that now so if you're at home uh, you want to participate with us with uh, some bread and juice feel free to do that of course um, yeah let's just go into the to prayer and uh, good to see that um, uh, Ken and Connie Burns are with us this morning and, and of course as you know Ken is going through a challenging time um, so uh, our prayers are with you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for um, uh, your uh, tremendous love for us. And as we reflect on the cross this morning, that's, um, that brings it home so much more. The sacrifice that you made for us because uh, un- unknowing, I, who knows why, but you love us desperately even in our, even in our sin and our rebellion. You love us desperately. And we're so thankful for the, your incredible grace through the cross. And uh, Lord, we do bring before you uh, in people in our congregation who are struggling uh, physically with ailment and challenges um, with various uh, situations. Lord, you know who they are. And um, we just ask your hand upon them right now uh, that your healing hand would touch them, if it be your will, Lord, their physical bodies. And uh, just that they would know your strength and peace and love deep within their spirits that you are with them every step of the way and whatever challenges we face Lord we just commit the future to you as a church uh, and uh, ask your hand upon us and um, uh, just uh, would trust you for that now Lord bless the message as we as we bring it forward and uh, as we look at the cross of Jesus may you speak to our hearts we pray in Jesus name Amen Amen so um, the message this morning is uh what does the cross of Jesus do? And I'm going to be reading from uh, Luke chapter 23, 32 to 34, and 44 to 46, which describes some 
uh, areas around the, uh, Jesus on the cross. And then we'll get into the message from there. Beginning at uh, verse 32. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. And uh, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple torn, was torn in two. And Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands. I commit my spirit. And when he said this, he breathed his last. So again, this Sunday we are sharing the Lord's table. And um, it's a time we remember, of course, the death of Jesus on the cross for our sins. But there are many things uh, the, the cross speaks to us about. And, and uh, what does, we're going to ask the question today, what does the cross of Jesus do? And there are many things that it does. And uh, this morning we're going to look at seven things. I hopefully go through it pretty quickly. Made it through last time, so we'll we'll get through it. Uh, but first of all, I want to suggest that the cross of Jesus centers us. It goes without saying that the uh, central symbol of the Christian faith is the cross. Right? We see it on the outside of church buildings. Uh, we see it on the inside of church buildings. One behind me, right? Sometimes you see the cross in bumpers of of cars and outside, uh, you know, on, on uh, outside of Christian books and. Many Christians wear the crosses around the neck. Some Christians make the sign of the cross with their hands. If we call ourselves Christians, the cross is always before us. It is a central symbol of our faith. In Luke 9, Jesus declared to his disciples that he was going to be crucified and that he must start moving towards Jerusalem. And all the rest of the, the Gospel of Luke, over half of it, describes his journey to Jerusalem on the road to crucifixion. And he said in Luke 9, 22 and 51, the Son of Man must, must suffer many things and be re rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. That was his goal, ultimately, for coming to earth to die on the cross. In John chapter 12, uh, Jesus said the cross was the main mission he came to earth. He said it himself. He said in verse 27, Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No! It was for this very reason I came to this hour. The preaching of the Apostle Paul was totally immersed in the cross of Christ. You read his, his gospel, his, uh, his letters and his epistles. They are just totally centered on, on, on the cross of Christ. He said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The only outward ritual Jesus asked us to do on a regular basis was to celebrate communion because the crucifixion of Jesus is the heartbeat of our faith and Jesus wanted to keep us in it. Don't forget, don't forget, He's saying. Don't ever forget. So, what does the cross of Jesus do? Well, first of all, it centers us. The cross of Jesus is the main focus of our faith. But what else does it do? Well, number two, the cross of Jesus offends us. Whoa, <laughs> really? Well, that doesn't sound too encouraging, does it? But sure enough, when we begin to see Jesus explaining the cross to his disciples, the response was not one of delight or encouragement. On the contrary, the response was one of anger. Matthew 26, uh, sorry, Matthew 16, 21 to 22. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and on the third be raised to, uh, to life. And then Peter, it's always Peter, isn't it? Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord! He said, this shall never happen to you. Peter was offended by the thought that Jesus would die on the cross. The Apostle Paul had said his main proclamation was to preach Christ crucified, but notice the response he got in 1 Corinthians 1.23. 
We preach Christ crucified, but a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. <laughs> Whenever he preached the gospel, the cross, there was not a great response. There was ridicule, resistance. I don't know about you, but whenever I, uh, you know, when I'm with people who don't, uh, who aren't Christians, and I start, you know, talking about anything that comes close to talking about the cross of Jesus, all of a sudden there's a spirit of, um, you know, uncomfortable discomfort. And the, in, in, in the, I guess the unspoken message is, uh, let's just change the subject if we can, please. <laughs> Apart from a miracle of God, all of us would avoid the cross of Jesus. So, let's summarize again. What does the cross of Jesus do? The cross of Jesus centers us, but it also offends us. Number three, the, tr the cross of Jesus forgives us. By putting his son Jesus on the cross, God is saying the major need of all human beings is forgiveness from God. Notice what Jesus said while he was mocked as he hung on the cross. Luke 23, 34. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. For they don't know what they're doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The night before his crucifixion, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, which he wanted all his followers to constantly remember from that day forward. Again, he said in Matthew 26, 28, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. You know, sometimes... Uh, when a husband and wife have an argument, have you ever had an argument as a husband and wife? I'm sure you have if you're married. Uh, there, you know, we're often offended at each other, and, and we sometimes even stop talking to each other. Does that ever happen? The silent treatment can go on for hours and maybe sometimes for days. I don't know. Eventually, one one of the one of the one of them may finally break down and humble themselves before the other and say some of the hardest words in the English language. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I think I was watching a Billy Graham crusade once when I was like a teenager. And he said, the hardest five words in the English language are, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I never forgot that. Hopefully, the other one will respond with a similar language. Of course I will forgive you, but would you also forgive me? And there's a beautiful reconciliation in the relationship. So when it comes to the relationship between humanity and God, there's also a similar strain between us. But of course, God has not done nothing wrong to offend us, even though we may be angry at him. True, he did have anger towards our rebellion and darkness because he can't stand sin. But that anger was poured out onto Jesus on the cross and through the cross, there is finally a way for God to offer forgiveness to us. Jesus said the blood, his blood on the cross was for the forgiveness of sins. So, the cross of Jesus centers us Surprisingly, it offends us, and thank God, it forgives us. Number four, the cross of Jesus justifies us. What does that mean? Well, the cross of Jesus displays the justice of God. You see, God was facing a dilemma. When someone commits high treason against the government, the usual punishment for the crime is death. At least it has been in, in, in uh, ages past. I don't know what's they do that these days, but it's a pretty serious crime when you, when you commit high treason. I mean, you're turning the whole country over to chaos, betraying the country that you're a part of. Anyhow, the, uh, the one who's been uh, commits high treason is brought before the court, and the judge declares them guilty, and they are sentenced to death. Now, the most serious crime that has ever been committed was when Adam and Eve committed high treason against God. Now, that's, there's a government you don't want to commit high treason against. God had given them the entire earth to rule, to extend his kingdom of love. But they listened to God's arch enemy, Satan. They sided with the enemy and turned the entire earth over to him. <laughs> Satan became the God of this world, as Paul calls him. And instead of the earth being saturated with love, joy and peace that comes from God it was infiltrated with hatred darkness and conflict the human race was infected right with Satan's self-centered nature and whether we think it's fair or not whether we think it's fair or not 
We are all born a part of the Adams family. And every human being is born with that self-centered nature. It just, it just happens. It's passed down. And that nature wants to be independent from God. And the cross of Jesus offends us because it reminds us that the only way we can be at peace with God is if we admit we are sinners and in need of forgiveness. The highest court of heaven is, the, is, 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 is God. He's the judge of the, of the highest court. And the evidence of our high treason towards him is undeniable, right? You can't hide it. God has no choice but to declare us guilty and sentence us to death. But here's the problem. He doesn't want to do that. Amazingly, because God is love, he still loves us even when we despise him. But what can he do? God is a law-abiding God. As the judge of the universe, he is just and must uphold the law. The death penalty must be administered. But God is pretty smart, right? He's pretty smart. And he has devised a brilliant plan to justly administer the death penalty to us and yet at the same time rescue us and restore us to a love relationship with him. So how in the world, how in the world can he do that? Well, here is the brilliant plan in three points. Number one, God came to the earth as a human being in the person of Jesus. The father of Jesus was God, but his mother was the human Mary. For the first time in history, here was a being who was fully God and fully human. And for the first time in history, a human being was born sinless and at peace with God Number two, Jesus would live his entire life as a human being, sinless and loyal to God, as God intended for us to be in the first place, right? Finally, a human being in the perfect image of God. And then, number three, something that we call the law of representation, which I don't have time to get into, but it's all through the Bible. The law of representation. Jesus would then represent all of humanity before God the Father. And he would take the entire sin and rebellion of all humanity from the beginning of time to the end of time from us and place it upon himself. But not only our sins but all of humanity itself was placed onto and into Jesus on the cross. And it was there in Jesus that the judge of the universe carried out the sentence of death upon all humanity. When Jesus died on the cross, we all died with him. <laughs> Amazing. We've all, we have already received, listen, we've already received the judgment of God for high treason in Jesus Paul describes this in several different places. Here's just four of them. It's all over the place. But here's a couple of verses. 2 Corinthians 5.14 For Christ's love compels us because we are, we are convinced that one died for all. Yeah, we know that. But listen to this. And therefore, all died. The law of representation. We were in Christ when he died. And then, of course, the famous verse, Galatians 2.20, one of my favorite verses. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. When Christ was crucified I, crucified, I was there with him. I have been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live. He says, I'm dead. The old Paul's gone. Dead and buried. Isn't that wonderful to think of? Your old life, gone, dead and buried. But Christ lives in me, he says. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. There's that representation again. Christ died for me, but I was also crucified with him. Amazing. And then a couple more verses. Romans 6, 7 to 8. Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. And if we died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. And then Colossians 3, 3. For you died, Paul says. You died. Really? Really? And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Isn't that wonderful? God looks down at me and my life 
Because it ain't perfect, nor is it either. It's hid, hidden with Christ in God. Whoa! Are you kidding me? That's hard to believe, isn't it? But that's what it says. And then, after Christ's resurrection, he became our advocate or intercessor or lawyer. You know what a lawyer is, of course. He's a lawyer. He became our lawyer before God the judge in the high court of heaven. Now, anyone who wants to be released from the death penalty can come before God the judge in the court of heaven with Jesus, our lawyer, at our side. Don't, don't try to go in there without Jesus. <laughs> and we can plead guilty as charged. Now, I pleaded guilty as charged before the throne of God on July 18, 1965, when I was convicted of my sin. And the Holy Spirit gave me the, the ability to realize, you know what, I need to take this to God and plead mercy. And when I pleaded guilty as charged, God was just going to sentence me to death when my lawyer, Jesus, leaped to his feet and said this to God. Your Honor, one moment, please. As you know, I came to earth as a man 2,000 years ago, and I lived a perfect, faultless life before you. And then I went to the cross. Not only took all of Ted's rebellious sins upon me, I took the very life of Ted upon me. When you judged me with death on the cross because of Ted's sins, you also judged Ted. He died with me. Your Honor, you cannot condemn Ted to death for his sin. He has already been judged and died for his sin. He died in me. And he is now accepting his death in me. If you charged him now, that would be double jeopardy. You know what double jeopardy isn't? Charging someone twice for the same crime? Can't be done. And then a big smile comes across the face of God. He slams his gavel down and says, Not guilty! <laughs> know those lovely words? Not guilty! Ted, because you have put your trust in my son's sacrifice for you, you are now justified and free and then God takes off his judge's robe and comes down to where I am standing and gives me a big hug and says welcome to the family Ted I am now your father and you are now my child that's called justification by faith I'm sure you've heard of it and it was rediscovered during the reformation period uh, and it reformed not only the church transformed the church but the entire western world was affected by it that's why we have the freedoms we have today, in my opinion. And that's why God can forgive us. It is because we've been justified through Jesus. And I believe we could really, if we could really get a handle on this, I, I think we just have a superficial understanding of it, but if we could really get a handle on it and depth of it, I think we would all be transformed, just my opinion. I believe we spend far too much time living in fear for acceptance instead of living in joy from acceptance. Only Christ can set us free from the power of sin. The way to holiness is not by trying, it's by trusting. Or as Paul says in Romans 1, it is by faith from beginning to end. So the cross of Jesus, here's a summary again, so the cross of Jesus centers us, it offends us, it forgives us, it justifies us. And fi uh, number five, the cross of Jesus loves us. The cross is an expression of God's love for us. The most famous verse in the Bible, I think, would be John 3, 16, right? Here's verse 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. No, I didn't send my Son to condemn you, but to save the world through him. Amazing. The cross is an, ex is an expression of Christ's love for us also. Ephesians 5, 2, Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Our love for God and each other is simply a constant response to the loving sacrifice Jesus has made for each one of us. Can you believe it? God loves us so much that he sacrificed his own son for us. We read in 1 John 4, 10 and 19. 
This is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. We love because He first, first loved us. The only way we can constantly love God and each other, the only way, really, is to keep our eyes on the cross of Jesus. We love because He first loved us. Contrary to our natural way of thinking, we do not earn God's love. We simply receive it as a gift and pass it on to others, and God receives the glory. This is the key to living a holy lifestyle. So here's a summary again. So the cross of Jesus centers us, it offends us, it forgives us, it justifies us, it loves us, and number six, we're getting there, the cross of Jesus saves us. The greatest problem for the human race, whether we realize it or not, is our separation from the love of God. When we are separated from God's love, it uh, kind of makes us feel empty and can make us miserable and even irritable. Have you been there? We scramble to find acceptance and fulfillment and purpose in all the wrong places. And we need, we need, the solution The solution is this, we need to be reconnected to the love of God and Jesus died to do that and to save us from the futility and deliver us from the condemnation of Satan. In the Old Testament, God lived among Israel in the temple at Jerusalem. But he was hidden away and separated from them by a huge curtain in front of the uh, most holy place. That's where uh, God dwelled. Because the people had sinned, they could not enter into the presence of God's holy love. Notice what happened to that curtain when Jesus died. We find this in Luke 23, 45 to 46. For the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. <laughs> Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. When Jesus took the judgment for our sin in our place, the floodgates into the presence of God and his love were broken open. No more guilt, no more shame, just a fountain of God's liquid love can now flow into our lives. We can now be saved. So the cross of Jesus, here we are in the summary again, centers us, it offends us, it forgives us, it justifies us, it loves us, and then it saves us. And finally, number seven, the cross of Jesus invites us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, a powerful, powerful chapter. Boy, just, if you ever get to just meditate on that every so often, then that really, that'll really encourage you. In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul emphasizes that God has done everything needed to reconcile all humanity back to himself. He's done everything. Jesus took our crud against God and God's anger against our crud. And in one fell swoop, swoop, he eliminated both of them on the cross. And he brought us together as one. Brilliant! That is the final solution. And God now asks believers to proclaim this good news to unbelievers and invite them to be reconciled to God. But it is a choice. God will never force his reconciling work on anyone. So let's take a look at 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 20. Powerful passage. I think it speaks for itself. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed us to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. You be reconciled to God. That's our response. That has to be our, our choice. So God is now offering an olive, an olive branch of peace to every human being. God is saying this, I have reconciled myself to you through my son Jesus. I love you and want you dearly, but it is your choice to receive my love and return my love. It is your choice 
to be reconciled to me. But I will respect your decision even if it breaks my heart. We began this morning by asking this question, what does the cross of Jesus do? And here are the seven answers among many that we could have given. And number one, the cross of Jesus centers us, is a heartbeat of our faith. Number two, the cross of Jesus offends us. It strikes hard against our pride. Number three, the cross of Jesus forgives us. God wants to restore the relationship between us. Number four, the cross of Jesus justifies us. God himself sacrificed himself to declare us just. Number five, the cross of Jesus loves us. What an amazing display of God's love. Number six, the cross of Jesus saves us. It delivers us from Satan's condemnation and into the arms of God. And number seven, the cross of Jesus invites us God has done everything to reconcile humanity back to himself, but each one has the freedom to either accept or reject what God has done for us through Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for this powerful reminder of uh, the most central part of our faith that, that we have, and that's the cross of Jesus. And we thank you so much. We thank you so much for it, Lord. Just prepare our hearts now as we uh, get ready for communion. May the depth of your love and the power of the cross and the power of your acceptance through Jesus become more real to us this morning than it ever has before. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. But this 
Those of us who are here in person this morning, uh, just a reminder, we're going to be handing out uh, both the wafer and the juice. We have to do it in one, one component together, and uh, there's, there's two layers you have to rip off in order to get to them, just a reminder. But let's focus on the bread first, the wafer, and it is a representation, of course, of the broken body of Jesus Christ. And um, it represents the um, physical pain that he went through. And, of course, that's bad enough. It's really a visual uh, event uh, that, that moves us to emotion as we see the beaten body of Jesus and how he suffered on the cross. But really, that suffering on the cross was, the physical suffering was really symbolic of a deeper spiritual suffering because it was there that all the sins of humanity, all you can imagine, all the darkness, every speck of darkness that from beginning of time to the end of time was focused in one beam of, of light, as it were, onto Jesus, and he accepted it all. He had never known an, a, a, one little teeny bit of sin, and he had the entire sin placed upon him. Can you imagine how he felt? We can't. And all he said was, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He had never known the forsaking of God, but there it was. Amazing. And that's what we want to remember this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the bread which represents the broken, hurting body of Jesus. And we pray that as we partake of it, you would speak deeply into our hearts about what you've done for us in taking everything that's evil and wrong and bad, not only of us, but of all humanity, upon yourself, so that we could be reconciled at one with you again. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Give it my work.
Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, <clears throat> verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We're now going to focus our attention on the cup, which of course represents the um, shed blood of Jesus, represents his death, primarily his death. And right at the beginning, the book of Genesis, we are told that Adam and Eve were told that, you know, if they, if they went their own way, if they committed high treason, if you will, that they, cho that they would die if they chose that they chose the wrong tree, the tree of knowledge. They're going their own way. I'm going to decide what's right and what's wrong. You'll die. And Paul said in Romans chapter 3, the wages of sin is indeed death. So, not only did Jesus take upon himself the pain of our sin, represented by the bread, broken body. He also took upon himself the judgment against our sin, and that is death. He died for us so that we could live with him. Let's pray for the cup at this time. Father, we thank you for the shed blood of Jesus. <clears throat> he not only took our sin, he took our judgment and died in our place and for this we give you much thanks much thanks Lord may your love and what you've done for us deeply touch our hearts this morning we ask this in Jesus name Amen Oh heaven declare glory of the can compare with the beauty of the Lord. Forever he will be the Lamb upon the throne. I gladly bow the knee and worship him alone. I will proclaim the glory of the risen Lord, who once was slain to reconcile man to God. Forever you will be the Lamb upon the throne. I gladly bow the knee. I gladly bow my knee and worship you alone. Forever you will be. Forever you will be the Lamb upon the throne. Lamb upon the throne. I gladly bow the knee. I gladly bow my knee and worship you alone. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Scripture tells us after Jesus and his apostles um, observed the Passover, where this tradition comes to us from, uh, that they sang a hymn and went out. And so we want to do that, but we always want to remind people of our benevolent fund. We do that on communion Sundays. And, and um, we have a fund in the church that is just designated to helping people. People in the church, people outside the church that have financial needs or needs that finances can help with. It's not part of our budget. It's not part of our, it doesn't pay for 
you know, the monthly things in the church, like salaries and, you know, heat and lights and that sort of thing. It's simply set aside to help people with. And we encourage you on, on a communion Sunday to give to that fund. So just keep that in mind. It does a lot of good. So Scripture says they sang a hymn and went out. So.
because you were forsaken I'm accepted You were condemned Well I'm alive and well The Spirit is within me Because you Amen. <coughs> Thanks for joining us this morning. Glad you could be here. Thanks for joining us online. And uh, yeah, if you're following us on Facebook or later on on YouTube and you're not from Williams Lake, you're not part of our church, church, we welcome you as well. I know I've gone on there a few times and seen people following from Texas or Georgia or Ontario. So uh, we welcome you. God loves you. Have a good week. Keep yourself safe. We'll see you next week. All right. Take care. Bye.